Hey, the Nun High School, this is Mr. Aiden. We're out of stoichiometry, and now we're into 2.1, Atomic Theory, so let's get it on. Um, atomic Theory, if we go back to what we did last year, we started with something like Dalton's view of the atom, which he believed it was just like a sphere, a big piece of matter. And um, it, it was... It, he thought it was indivisible, indestructible, and he was wrong, dude. He was flat out wrong. There was stuff inside there, but he, we didn't know that until we did a bunch more experiments. J.J. Thompson did the cathode ray experiment, and he found out there were these negative things inside the atom, and we called those electrons. He, but he remember this was a chocolate chip cookie model. He thought the chocolate chip itself was, or the cookie itself was positively charged. Uh, he was wrong, but he was uh, getting there. Rutherford did the gold foil experiment. He shot some positive alpha particles. They bounced off, which means there was something inside. Uh, most of them went straight through, which meant most of the atom was empty space. So he was correct about that. But on right on the inside, he we found out that there was this positively core center called the nucleus. And he didn't know where to put the electrons. He just thought they were just out here in empty space, um, which was kind of right, but not really right. Um, then came along Bohr. Bohr had this sort of this, what he called an orbit, right? An orbit theory. Um, he knew the nucleus was in the center, and it was made up of protons, and we knew neutrons as well. And protons, of course, have a mass of one and a charge of one, okay? A charge of positive. It's a proton. Okay, and it's got a lot of mass. A neutron has a mass of one, but has literally no charge at all. It's kind of the glue that holds all those protons together in that nucleus. And the electron, he thought the electron were, was out here on some orbit, um, and they basically have no mass at all. They're they're just uh, they're so small. They do have a mass, but it's so small compared to the proton and neutron. We could say the mass is zero here in chemistry. The charge is negative one. And Bohr thought it was this orbit theory because when, when, when he would blast it with some energy, that electron would jump up to what we call an excited state, and then it would come back down and give off um, energy in the form of color or a wavelength of light. Um, a few things we have to know is that the atomic number is the number of protons. So if we have six protons, uh, an atomic number of six, we have carbon. Always, the protons tell you what element you have. Now, the mass comes from the protons and the neutrons, because, of, co of course, those are the things that have mass. So the nucleus is what gives you all that mass. And we know we can have a different number of protons, sorry, the same number of protons and a different number of neutrons, and we call that an isotope. Remember, your periodic table, it, it gives you an average of the isotopes. So, say, sulfur's molar mass is 32.06. It means that the mass is mostly 32 because it's closer to that number. Okay, and then of course the charge would be your protons minus your electrons. Now Bohr was getting on the right track, but this is what we believe today is that um, we have this theory of the atom, which is electron cloud, and they're not in orbits, but they're in orbitals. Okay, and that brings us to the periodic table of our periodic table set up in these orbitals. You see that um, that left-hand slot with the blue is the s orbital. The one to the right, the green, is the p orbital. The transition metals are the d orbitals, and the inner transition metals are, of course, the f orbital. Okay. And if you see, if you have something like this, you have something like sodium, which which is uh, right here. Sodium is is going to end in 3s1. And so if you want to know its electron configuration, you just go from the very beginning. We have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Okay, if you have something like krypton right at the end there, um, krypton, if we want to go, go to that electron configuration, we're going to do 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, woo, and then 4p6, okay? Um, keep in mind, these horizontal things are called periods, okay? So you see hydrogen and helium, they're in the first, the n equals 1 period, okay, or the first period, what we would call it. Um, the 2s and the 2p, they're in the second period, of course. The 3s and the 3p are in the third period. And so we have these different orbitals, the n, or sorry, the periods, n equals 1, n equals 2, n equals 3, really easy. Um, the vertical um, groups of elements are called families, or sometimes we call them groups, and we know the alkali metals and the alkaline earth metals and the halogens and the noble gases, and these are all 
vertical right here. Okay, um, let's go to uh, courtesy of Dr. Gelder from uh, Oklahoma State University. Um, this is a great representation of the Alfball principle, the Paul exclusion, Paul exclusion principle, and Hun's rule. Alfball principle says we basically have to fill in at the lowest energy first. Okay, and you can see hydrogen, and then here's helium. The one S is the lowest energy, so it fills in there first. It's not going to jump up to the two S or the two P first. Okay. If we saw an electron jump up, that would be, call, be called an excited state. But if you see helium has his electron configuration is 1s2, okay? And you can see pa the Pauli exclusion principle says that each of these um, boxes can only hold two electrons and they're going to pair up. Okay, one's going to go up, one's going to go down, they're going to pair together. Okay? And and as we start adding electrons, you can see here's lithium and then beryllium and you can see what's happening the boron the carbon the nitrogen and then you know and you can see they're filling first in the lower energy level uh, towards the bottom is the lowest energy now something we see is called a hun's rule right here nitrogen has five valence electrons and he's got three in in the 2p orbital and you can see it fills one in each box before it pairs, okay? And so if you see, uh, it, you can see why nitrogen would try to um, take three electrons in order to be like a noble gas. You see oxygen, you can see fluorine, and so you can see its charge sitting there. Fluorine, of course, in the halogens would like to be negative one, tends to be negative one, so that it can have an electron configuration like a noble gas, like neon. Neon's got a full electron configuration. Here's sodium, here's magnesium, and then aluminum, and I'll show you through. It makes total sense that they're going to go one in each box before they start pairing. Here we have another noble gas. Now, this is interesting. When we have potassium and then calcium, see what just happened to the, the energy level of the d orbital. Okay? And this is why your periodic table goes 4s, and then it goes 3d before the 4p. And it's because it takes less energy to fill in the 3d than it does the 4p, okay? And so if you think about it, there's scanium, there's titanium, there's vanadium, there's chromium, but you're going to see what's going to happen to chromium right here. Chromium is so close to being half-filled, having a half-filled orbital. So it takes one from the s to have a half-filled d orbital. It's, it's actually less energy in order to do that. It's called an exception. Here's manganese, and then we have um, iron. And a note about an iron is iron is what we call paramagnetic, which I means iron is attracted to the magnets. Now, why is iron attracted to the magnetics? Magnets is because see all these electrons that are unpaired. Okay, we call that para. The prefix para means alongside of, or par like parallel lines. They're able to be magnetized or polarized. Okay, and so iron is paramagnetic, okay, attracted the magnets. Here's cobalt, nickel, we have copper, and what you're going to see, what, what's copper going to do? Copper is going to take one from the S and fill that D. So actually copper's electron configuration is going to be 4S1, 3D10, because it's a whole lot more energy efficient to have a full D orbital. And here we have zinc. Now zinc is what we call diamagnetic. Dia, di meaning two all his electrons are paired together. So zinc is not attracted to electrons. Zinc is not attracted to electrons. Oh, sorry, magnets. Why? Because all his electrons are paired together. Okay? Uh, just one more thing. See zinc here? Zinc ends up being plus two. Why? Because it loses these two electrons from the 4s before anything else. Okay? I um, hope this helped, guys. Uh, remember to go to that vodka, go to the Google Docs quiz on MrRain.com and do 2.1. Thanks, guys.